All right, cool. Hey, thanks for sticking around. Like I said, my name's Abraham. Uh, I'm recently, uh, I, I graduated a program called Dev Bootcamp in uh, 2013. And uh, uh, this talk came about as, as I was considering uh, what it meant to, to be an engineer. Um, and it might be, for some of you, from the perspective of, of someone that's, that's relatively new, because that's my perspective. Uh, but hopefully, those of you that are have been doing this for a while have something to gain from this too. Uh, my name is Abraham. Like I said, be happy to talk to you um, after this or on Twitter. It's cool with me. I work for a company called Centro in Chicago. Um, thanks for, to them for letting me come out here and be with you. So the name of my talk is TED for Your Soul: uh, Virtue and Web Development. So, what is TED? First of all, right? Uh, TED is Test Driven Development. It's an acronym for uh, that refers to a process that people have found helpful um, to develop software. And so simply, it's, it's, you could sum it up as red, green, refactored. Red is just meaning that uh, most of the libraries that you would use to, to write unit tests, uh, if the test is failing, it would display as red, uh, just to let you know. And um, when the test passes, it displays green. So, so the first step in TDD is to write a test or a spec uh, that fails. Uh, so this test is going to uh, specify some behavior that you haven't implemented yet. Uh, so you, you write the test, you run it, and it's read because it's, it's failing. The next step is to get that test to pass. So you write the code uh, that actually performs the behavior that you specified earlier. And once you've done that, you run the test goes back to his dream, you know that you've done what you set out to do. And the, the third step is to refactor. A lot of people forget this step. I know I have, uh, but, but refactoring is, is, uh, is done easily at this point because you have a, a test that uh, guarantees that your behavior is, is set. As long as that test is showing up green, you can rename variables, you can reorganize your code, get rid of state, uh, you know, abstract things. That there's a whole host of options that open up at this point in refactoring. And you know, the reason a lot of us don't refactor is because we don't want to break anything. So your tests help you ensure that you're not breaking anything. So that's TDD uh, in terms of test driven development for software. And I started to think to myself, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so it helps me when I'm staring at just my a blank screen. You know, it helps me to get started by writing a test. Often for me, at this point, there's so many options that it helps me just narrow things down and um, write a test to, that specifies what I'm trying to accomplish. I like how David Stells put this in his blog post. Uh, he said, it's about figuring out what you're trying to do before you run off half cock to try to do it. Uh, this blog post, uh, it's, it's old, and, and, it, and he ended up writing RSpec after this blog post, I believe, and, and RSpec, um, so Jasmine borrows a lot from RSpec for describing if logs. I don't know if you've used Jasmine uh, to test your JavaScript, but um, at, so I like how you put this. That it's about having a goal in mind before you start coding. I think this is very helpful. It's been helpful for me. Uh, so, but I started to think, you know, what if we apply this TD process to ourselves, uh, to who we are as people, to our character, and uh, what if we, we, we had a goal in mind for who we wanted to be and we, we approached it like engineers would. You know, what would happen? And would this be a useful process? Uh, and what I found is that uh, it can be. It can be very useful. Uh, but, but let me just admit that I didn't get into coding with all these lofty goals of developing character. Um, and, and uh, you know, I also, I, I think that the reason why we need it is, is evident in the fact that science and technology isn't self-directing, right? It can be used for good or it can be used for ill. I think the best example from pop culture is Walter White. You know, somebody know what I'm talking about? Breaking Bad, anybody? Has anybody seen this show? Okay, yeah, so you're tracking with me. Uh, you know, this guy's a genius. He's a chemist. He sets up a lab, but, but he doesn't use, Walter White doesn't use his power for the benefit of society, right? He uses it to build a meth empire. You know, the prophecy, the, the you know, total polar opposite of that. Um, and, but, you know, I, like I said, I didn't get into software development to try to uh, think about virtue and character development or anything like that. I got into uh, 
uh, soft aroma to get paid. You know, I just uh, just the simple things in life. I wanted to eat olives out of a goblet. You know? um, I wanted to have bodyguards just standing there watching my dogs play poker. This, this is what I was aspiring towards, and uh, uh, it turned turned out as I was learning what it meant to be an engineer um, that the process of software development could be not just a chance for me to, to feed my family, but and actually a chance for me to become the best Abraham that I could become, you know, the best person I could become. And uh, so as I talk about TDD for your soul, hopefully that's what's available to you as well. So let's talk about uh, what it means to grow as a person. The, the framework I want to use are the four classical virtues. As you started with Aristotle, but you know, moral philosophers throughout the ages have used them, uh, picked up at them, and developed them, you know, Augustine, Aquinas, everyone else coming after them. The four classical virtues, I'm sure you already know what they are. You look like a virtuous bunch to me. <laughs> but you know, the people in the back, especially up top, they look shady. So <laughs> let's just reiterate, let's just reiterate. Uh, the four classical virtues are self-control, justice, courage, and wisdom. Self-control, justice, courage, and wisdom. But what do those have to do with software development? Anyway, let's go through them. First virtue is self-control. Self-control. My lack of self-control shown uh, so readily when I started to learn how to code, especially when I encountered an error message. And the error messages to me were just so debilitating. I, I didn't know how to properly use them. I didn't know how to see them as information that could be useful. I just, they just seemed like they were derailing my flow. You know? And especially when, you're, when I was on my own at first, I think that's the hardest time is not knowing how to debug, not knowing how to get unstuck, not, not knowing how to read documentation and, and use the resources that are available. Uh, so so my, my lack of patience and anger uh, quickly came out in these moments. Maybe some of you were like me. I think this slide really speaks to the developer's condition. Um, you know, this oscillation, right, from euphoria to despair. It, it just shows a lack of self-control. Um, and I think we've all been there, it, it, that is if you're anything like me. Uh, but it, I think it's hard to talk about self-control in general in our industry. You know, uh, the platonic ideal of, of our, our work environment looks like this. You know, it's, uh, my dad worked in the sewer department in the city of Chicago, and I, I don't think he'd under, understand what this is. You know, it looks more like a... You know, an adult Chuck E. Cheese or something like, that. <laughs> it's like a place to work, right? I mean, the self-control, it, it's, it, it, there's some cultural in, um, things in our way, I think. Uh, but maybe, you know, somewhere I've been talking, you're like, Abraham, I don't have an anger problem. I don't need all the accoutrements. I'm a simple person. I, um, I don't experience the highs and lows like you talked about. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe for you, self-control rears its head in these situations. Right, has someone else been here? This is uh, something I have to resist often. But uh, you know, as developers, we have this this uh, this drive to know what's right and what's true, and often to share that with other people. That's all good. Uh, but some of us don't know when to turn it on and when to turn it off, when to engage, uh, when to exhibit some self control, and realize it's not worth arguing over. Uh, so these are situations where our lack of self control can manifest itself. And, and these were apparent to me as I learned how to code. And I started to think, what if I started to look at the rest of my life where, where uh, my lack of self-control is affecting my relationships? Uh, my dad taught me everything I knew through action movies. You know, that was just his way. And uh, I still remember when Dirty Harry said this, you know, man's got to know his limitations. And that's what considering your, your uh, lack of self-control is about, is knowing what your weaknesses are and uh, knowing how to approach them, how to plan for them. Uh, and, and so the process of, of software development uh, can reveal your lack of self-control, but it also it can, you can, it's a moment for you to think about the rest of your life where impatience, anger, um, really high highs and really low lows, you know, uh, 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 argument, an argumentative nature. These things, like where have they affected the rest of your life? And, and this could be a moment at a time for you to engage uh, and, and think about what it could take for you to change and grow in that, that virtue of self-control. Let's, let's consider the next virtue, which is courage. So courage, 
what's courage about? Courage, you know, uh, simply with engineering, I think there's two ways to talk about courage. One is, is this mindset that we have to have. Of, when we see a problem, uh, especially a problem we've never encountered before, instead of running away from it, we run towards it. You know, uh, uh, we get wrapped up in, in solving problems, right? I mean, I skipped meals because I was coding. You know, there's just this drive to, to finish, um, to come to a solution, and not just an adequate solution, but like possibly the best solution you could come up with, right? There's this, developers have that in them, and it's not, it, uh, not everyone has that. You know, that's a, uh, what I hear people say, anyone can learn to code, the thing that I um, put, want to push back on is, yes, that's true, but not everyone can code uh, professionally because not everyone has this, this type of, this mentality Although I think it can be taught. Uh, I like how Richard Feynman described it. So he won the Nobel Prize in Physics, but he dismissed the award. Instead, he talked about, I think this, this is what undergirded his courage as a scientist was he, he said, you know, the, the, the prize is the pleasure of, of finding the thing out, the, the kick in the discovery, the observation that other people use it, meaning it's work. Those are the real things. So Richard Feynman, that's what, what drove him in his courage. Uh, the other way I think it's relevant to talk about courage as a, a web developer is in, the, in this context of pair programming. Those are two pairs on a computer desk. This is the worst slide I have. Just, uh, I just love it though. I can't, I can't get rid of it. So pair programming, for those that don't know, it's Two developers sitting at one machine, uh, two monitors, you know, hopefully they're mirrored, but, uh, and usually a one keyboard would suffice. So the, the idea is that one person is actually using the keyboard, the other person is engaged, uh, asking questions, uh, proofreading, uh, it could be, could be directing the, the coding process. And it's two development, and hopefully they, they would switch at some point. But pair programming is a real-time collaboration. Uh, but this can be frightening. This requires courage because you're exposing your thoughts in real time. And those thoughts might be all over the place, right? Especially if you're pairing with someone that's a lot more experienced than you. I've, I know I felt intimidated pairing with people um, when I felt like I wasn't up to it, up to the task. Right? Uh, let me show you a little. This is Ruby code, um, so nobody faints or anything. but. This is, uh, when I first learned how to code, it was in Ruby. And this is a real example from you know, two years ago. But I had, I had this exercise where I wanted to find the mode of an array of integers. All right, so I, I think it took me two hours, possibly longer. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, I'm in God mode, and I'm in depression mode. I mean, it's, it was horrible. But I, I got this thing working, it worked, felt great. Uh, I, and I talked to my friend, and he showed me a solution. Right, and, uh, so if I had this courage in that moment, I'd be like, wow, that's a great solution. What could I learn from it? But instead, I couldn't even, couldn't even accept it. You know, it was, I was kind of like, yeah, that's OK. If, you know, you're going for simplicity. <laughs> <laughs> so in that moment, I felt threatened by the solution. Instead of I wasn't open to learning. That's what <coughs> type of courage that, that's required to, to properly, you know, to, to take advantage of, of moments of, uh, we're exposed to, to, to new ideas and better ways of doing things. Instead of feeling threatened, there's a courage that you're ready to learn at, at, at any point, right? I like how Brene Brown said this in her book, Daring Greatly. So this is a sociology. Uh, she, Brene Brown is a sociologist. This book's not about coding, but I like how she put this. Uh, courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. That is pair programming. You can't help but be seen. There's nowhere to hide uh, unless you just sit there and and, and you know, don't do anything. Uh, but that can be the frightening part of it. And, and I think uh, for, a, for a lot of us, the reason why we wouldn't pair is because it's lack of courage. And so it's not, this is another opportunity for us to think about what else, uh, where else are we being held back from the lack of courage? What are steps in our lives, in our relationships, uh, in our family, in our community? It, this is a moment, too, where we can think about how can we grow uh, in courage, not as just as development, but uh, in the rest of our lives. So the next virtue, the next virtue is justice. Justice, justice, a lot of people talk about justice. What does justice have to do with engineering at all? And what does that have to do with web development? 
Well, you know, uh, Lady Justice is typically depicted as blind, uh, but often, often is blind, not always, but often, uh, usually it's with scales in her hand, right? And she's weighing something out. That, the, the idea is that justice, simply put, is giving to each what they are owed. Giving to each what they are owed. And, and, and you can extend that to not just people, but to institutions and communities, traditions, that sort of thing. So it's weighing out these obligations, navigating all those. But in order to do that, right, you need to pursue, uh, you need to perceive a, a cosmic order, some set of obligations that you have. And, and then you have to navigate all those, even when they're conflicting. That's, that's the idea of justice. And, and so we're all going to have uh, different views of justice. We're all going to have different conceptions of, of uh, what are our obligations, what aren't our obligations, and, and how do we even navigate those. That's where we have uh, conflicts between our views of justice. But hopefully, there's enough overlap in this room where we can look at something like this and realize we don't want to be in this situation. We, we don't want our face in this slide, right? Like, there's something wrong with this intuitively, uh, but maybe you never made a connection. This is actually talking about justice, that writing unmaintainable code and then leaving this company, that's an unjust practice. What I would say there's, is there's just code and there's unjust code. So what does that even mean? That sounds really esoteric, right? So I like how Sandy Metz put this. This book is about all, all in general, um, it uses Ruby examples, but I like what she said about just design, that design is more um, the art of preserving changeability than it is the act of achieving perfection. So changeability is this attribute I would, I would attach to just code. So code that is just, it navigates these obligations that it has. So what, what could the obligations be for code? Well, I would say it's changeability. Changeability means uh, two things, right? One, that the requirements are going to change. That's just a, that's a given. You know, it's a presupposition. Like, the requirements uh, that you're trying to meet in that moment when you're writing the code are going to change. There's going to be use cases that change. Uh, there's going to be different applications. Uh, things are going to change. Nothing is, is static. And, and so that's one, that's one piece of, there's code that, that uh, coheres with that, that idea that, that things are going to change. So it's written in a way that it's it's uh, extensible, right? It's it's uh, it's easy, as easy as it can be to, to maintain, to extend, and to to for other people to write. That's the other piece of it, is that who does your code belong to, right? It's not just for you in your professional setting and on an open source project, um, you know, you're in a hackathon, whatever it is. This code isn't just for you, right? It's for the people that will use it after you, even. Maybe after you're long gone, so the other people that need to read it, they'll need to see documentation, make sense of it. After all the knowledge that you had, the tacit knowledge, uh, you it's not there anymore. So, so code that's just is, is open to being changed, but also it considers that the, all these other users that will come along later. So it takes a lot of energy, right, to code in this way. I mean, it's not natural. I don't, you know, if you remember that example I just put up with that. Uh, my only concern in, in creating the, in finding the mode of an array of integers was that it would spit out the right answer. It wasn't about organization or maintainability or, um, uh, you know, uh, being well expressed, anything like that, right? And, uh, but it takes extra work to do that stuff, at least until it becomes second nature. It takes more work to, to write documentation, to, to organize your code, and uh, to think about producing just code. And so the only reason to really do it is that this is a value for you that to produce just code. Maybe you never thought about it in that way, but that's actually what it is. I like how uh, Michael Sandel, he's a professor at Harvard, he taught a really interesting course on justice. I think it's available online, actually. Uh, so that he said that thinking about justice seems inescapably to engage us in thinking about the best way to live. And so. We think about producing just code. We can start to think, you know, am I producing code that that it, that coheres to all of its obligations? But also, like, what about the rest of my life? Do I uh, am I living in a way that's just? That am I satisfying all the obligations that that I have and that that others have with me? Whether it's your, your loved ones, your family, your friends, 
your employers, like the community you come from, right? Your neighborhood. There's all these different obligations that we have. And are we living lives that are just? Not just as developers, just as people. That, so this is an opportunity to think about that and, and possibly grow in this virtue. Lastly, last virtue is wisdom. Wisdom. What does wisdom have to do with web development, if anything? Well, uh, as I was starting to learn how to code and how to write software, I came across the idea of, test, of uh, design patterns, right? Design patterns, Bob Martin said, uh, defined it this way, that a design pattern is a well-worn and known good solution to a common problem. Design patterns are definitively not new. Rather, they're old techniques that have shown their usefulness over a period of many years. So, design patterns are, you might not even know where they came from, right? The fan pattern, observer pattern, like, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's cool to look into the history behind some of these and how they evolve, but to use them, you don't need to trace out you know, some etiology or anything, right? You, you just implement them, you use them as, as you see fit, as you, you see them to be useful in your situation. So this is how it works for coding, um, using design patterns, patterns that other people have told you about, you might have read in a book, you wrote, you know, heard in a talk, saw in a blog post, and you start to implement that. So what, what would it mean to find design patterns for life, for life itself, right? That's what wisdom really is, is the art of skillful living, making good decisions, uh, knowing which path to take, which steps to take, knowing when to say no, these types of things, right? Um, and I found this quote, from Confucius. I don't read Confucius, so I don't know if he actually said this. The internet told me about this, so hope it sounds good though. Uh, by three methods we may learn wisdom. First, it's by reflection, which is the noblest. Second, by imitation, which is easiest. And third, by experience, which is the bitterest. So I think this is very accurate. I mean, you know, how many, how many, how many of us have time to actually sit and reflect? How many, how many of us carve out time where we can have silence and, and time to meditate and write notes, uh, to think about choices you've made, uh, the path you're taking? You know, a lot of us are so busy. We have so many toys and so many responsibilities, so many interests that we don't have that time for the noblest path. But there's another path, right? Experience, which Confucius says is bitterest. But a lot of us, this is how we learn is by experience, whether it's good or bad. It's just, if we don't make that mistake, we're not going to learn from it. But, but, but imitation, imitation is about finding people that are worth imitating, right? Um, so in, develop, uh, in the developer word, world, that's, that's a lot of what we see. This conference, to me, showed, showed me a lot of people that, that are worth imitating in terms of how they approach uh, solving problems with code, right? Uh, but what about for the rest of your life? Like, who's living that life that you want to live? Like who's, who's worthy of imitation? And are you in contact with anybody like that? Whether it's someone, an author, or some, better than that, it's someone in person, right? Someone that you know, that you can talk to, you can get these <coughs> light design patterns from. There's someone like that. Uh, a lot of us live in isolation in this regard, where we just think, you know, magically, I hope I just become more wise. Uh, but we're not proactive about seeking that, um, that type of input. So, so this could be a moment, right, to grow in wisdom, a moment to, to look at our lives and think about, uh, do we have this art of skillful living? And so we, you know, just to recap, the four classical virtues, there was self-control, courage, justice, and wisdom. And, and so if taking these, right, and, and writing tests, getting back to the idea of TDD for our souls, a writing test would consist of a reflection of along these lines, I think these are great from, uh, uh, they come from this philosopher, he, he, uh, he said, that, you know, he gave three broad questions. Uh, who am I, who ought I to become, and how ought I to get there? You can think of these like as feature specs or something even, if you want to keep stretching the metaphor. Uh, so, so, what would it look like to TDD your soul? And, and an example of this would be something that I've implemented for myself is just along the lines of courage that often I found myself resisting the opportunity to learn because I was afraid of exposing my ignorance. So the test would be to, for me to write a test about, Abraham, are you being courageous at work? And I, I was failing that test. And so 
the next step is to implement habits and behaviors that would help me to pass that test. And this is all subjective, right? But uh, I started to I started to practice um, this this habit of of just saying a half hour maximum time limit that I would stay stuck at a, in a in a problem. Uh, so I, I try to read documentation, try different angles, but at that half hour elapsed and I would ask for help. And, and I work at a great place where I can get help easily. And it's never been something where I need to be afraid of asking for help, but it's always been internal. I just didn't want to admit I needed it. And this was a, you know, as a beginner, this is something I have to wrestle through. And uh, so I, this is how I practice this. It's ready right for me. And the refactoring comes from, after a moment, I mean, that half hour time, I don't do that anymore. That's the refactoring piece. I don't need that that type of uh, artificial rule. But um, uh, that's the process of TUD for the soul. That, that's the way I, I approach it. And, and so for you, you know, the question would be for you to consider these broad questions and, and what they mean in your life. So I can end it here. I've given this talk before and I can just end it there. TUD for your soul. Came up with this. Try it out maybe. And I can, we can all go, right? But, I need to just talk a little bit about why don't people, why, why, what's one big obstacle even doing this, right? And a lot of people are just going to walk out here and be like, that was great, see ya, I'm never going to think about this again. And, uh, and I found this cool slide, I had to, to put this in here too. Um, but the reason why, the big reason why a lot of us won't TDD our souls is, is because of shame. I think that somehow, somewhere, we were taught to have shame over our failures. And so why would we uh, write these failing tests about our, our weaknesses, our, our lack of character? Why would we introduce more shame uh, to our shame plate, right? Like that's ridiculous. And you know, what is shame even? Uh, it can be contrasted with guilt, right? So guilt is feeling badly about something you've done, where shame is feeling badly about who you are, right? So shame is, is often centered around this idea, right? Like, Am I good enough? And when you're feeling ashamed, the answer is no. The answer that we hear is no. And so, uh, if you're already feeling this way, why would you invite more of it in, right? Because it means that you're, you have failures and weaknesses, uh, it just feeds that voice and tells you you're not good enough and that uh, you're a failure and that um, you have these flaws. And no one wants to hear that. No, almost nobody would want to go through that process, right? But what I'm saying is that there is a different way to look at these things that, in fact, that our failures don't have to drag us down, uh, but there's a buoyancy that, that we can have with failures where they become not an anchor pulling us down, but uh, a vehicle towards growth and, and developing virtue. And, and so there's a different way to look at these as failures where we're not wallowing in them, we're not afraid to admit them either uh, because we, we're seeing that they're actually going to help us grow and so, does anybody know who this is? Shout it out if you do. Shepherd. Shepherd Book from Firefly, right? So, uh, he's a religious character. This, this is from a, a series that was on TV called Firefly. It was canceled. And there's a movie called Serenity that came out um, due to the fans and their demands for some resolution in the series. It's really cool. Uh, and so, I'm a big fan. Joss Whedon. The writer behind this, so nerds would recognize that if you're a nerd like me. But uh, so Shepard Book was—he was a religious character, and he often had these clashes with the, the main character of the Firefly world, whose name is Mal. Mal is, you know, an agnostic. I think he was just hostile to the ideas of religion that that Shepard Book had. Uh, but but at one point in the story, Shepard Book knew that he needed to motivate Mal to make a decision. We also knew he had to get past his, his, uh, his, his hostility. He said, he said to Mal, I don't care what you believe, just believe it. You know, I don't care what you believe, just believe it. And that's what he told him in order for him, for Mal to be ready to take that next step. And so for me, uh, the metaphysical grounds for the way I approach failure and um, growing in virtue and, and um, not being, not succumbing to shame, but, but uh, uh, using those moments to, to take me on this journey of, of 
growing in virtue. These, these things come to me from the resources I have. Uh, because I, I follow Jesus Christ. That might not be the path for everyone here. But we need to all find grounds and the resources to go on this journey if we're going to grow in virtue. And so, I don't care what you believe, just believe it, whatever it is, right? The, the only choice that's, that would be horrible to make would be to not make a choice at all. Uh, because what, what's open to us is a chance to grow and to become the best people that we can become. I, so I call it the blues mentality. I come from Chicago, and the history of blues are really interesting. It's, blues music has affected every genre of music we're talking about, I would say. Um, and I like how Ralph Ellison put this, that uh, the blues is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near comic lyricism. And so, what this thing is, our failures don't have to destroy us, right? But we can squeeze something beautiful from it. And I'm not talking about making music, although that's cool too. Um, but I'm saying squeeze from it this journey of growing in virtue. So with this mentality, uh, we can admit our flaws. We can admit where we don't um, have self-control, justice, courage, or wisdom. We can be frank about that, but uh, not to just stay in that moment, but to use those moments to incorporate the behavior and the habits that we need to grow in those four areas. And thereby, you know, this process of teaching our soul is not just about becoming better software developers, better engineers, but about becoming better people who benefit us all. Thank you.